Rabbi Shulweis is my teacher, my rabbi. And Mark Borowitz is my chavrusa, which means he is my study partner. And for 20 years, 25 years now, uh, we have been learning together. And much of what we've learned is the rabbi's thought. So I asked Mark tonight to come and to share. In his professional life, Rabbi Borowitz is the founder and spiritual leader of Beit Shuva, which is the only truly Jewish recovery center and uh, treatment center in the country for Jews who have lost their way in the world and are beginning to find their way home. And in his real life, he is a, a prophet, much like the rabbi, who sees things that the rest of us can't see. And what he specifically does is see the humanity in people that have lost their way. It's a privilege to have Rabbi Borowitz here. Thank you. I'm going to talk over at this one. So, um, <clears throat> First of all, I'm not the founder. My wife, Harriet Rosetto, is the founder of Beit Shuva. She's a therapist, a, a licensed clinical social work worker. And when I first met um, Rabbi Schulweis after I got out of prison in uh, 1989, and I told him that I was, you know, what was happening, et cetera, and about Beit Shuva, and Harriet and I were living together at the time, and I said, and she's a therapist, he said, I understand your problem. <laughs> and I understand how blessed you are. So th there's a few stories that I want to just tell about Rabbi Schulweis. When I came here um, to talk to um, Rabbi Vogel and, and Rabbi Schulweis about Beit Shuvah and about what we do, and that we wanted to talk to the congregation, I will tell you that not many people wanted to talk to us in, in, in the Los Angeles community. And Rabbi Schulweis was listening, and he said, well, of course you have to come. And we came up with a Friday night, and, and they had dinner for us here. And I didn't know who was going to come, but Rabbi Schulweis was here. And he sat, and he listened to everybody's stories. And he told everybody at, at, at um, the service as much what Rabbi Feinstein has said over these 25 years. You have a place here. You belong. You matter. I sign all of my emails with you matter because that's what I learned from Rabbi Schulweis. When he embraced me, he said, those are the things you, de you did. They're not who you are. And it was so powerful to hear it from a man of, of, of Rabbi Schulweis's stature and to be accepted by him helped me accept me so much more. Another story, when Rabbi Feinstein was, was ill in 1998, in the beginning of 99, I was a rabbinical student at, at the University of Judaism. And people were talking and they were saying all these crazy things. And I was so aggravated, and, and in my younger days, I used to be a little bit of a hothead and, and, and would yell and scream and things like that. I, I don't do that much anymore. Probably too much for most people, but not as much. And I called up Rabbi Schulweis. It was uh, before cell phones, and I, I went to the payphone. And I, and I called Rabbi Schulweis, and... <clears throat> His secretary answered, and I said, it's, it's very important that I speak to him. And he wasn't at the shul. She said, call him at home. And I called him at home because I was so upset. I didn't want any negativity at all about Rabbi Feinstein. And I said to him, I said, Rabbi Shores, I want to go tell these people. And I, I, and I went off for 10 minutes. And he just listened, and he said, Mark, Talking to them will do no good because already you know that they can't listen and they can't hear. He says, save it for people who can and people who will. And that spiritual counseling that Rabbi Schulweis gave me that day has stayed with me all of these years because I could have blown up my whole life. And he knew that. And he cared enough about my life and the work that I do that he didn't want anything to happen. 
And I'm going to end with my favorite Rabbi Sholwey story. Actually, it's, it's one that Rabbi Feinstein and I were, were um, blessed to be part of. Rabbi Feinstein and I uh, um, study. We, we were studying at that time. We were studying every Friday afternoon. I would come after school at UJ. I'd come up here, and we'd learn together. And one of these times, Rabbi Schulweis walks in. And it was right after um, Rabbi Jonathan Omerman had been here. And Rabbi Omerman had talked about surrender. Now, being in a 12-step program, I understand what surrender is. Rabbi Schulweis, absolutely not. And he started talking. I said, well, you know, Rabbi, if you look at, and he, he started talking. And then he got up, and he was talking louder. And I, of course, being a brash young boy, I just stood up and started arguing with him. And we're going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And, and Ed's sitting there not saying a word. The two of us look at Ed, and we say, no. He says, I'm not crazy enough to get in between you two. <laughs> so next morning is Shabbos. I'm, I'm at shul. I'm here at Shul, and, and uh, <laughs> I don't know, it must have been 98, right? 97 or 98. And whatever the Torah portion is, Rabbi Shulwai saw me, and he made this left turn and went off on surrender. And I mean just a whole thing. And he says, any comments, Mark. And I have this split second to decide, what am I going to do? So being true to, to Rabbi Schulweis's, uh, uh belief that all of us should speak our truth, I argued with him. During the recessional, I'm sitting, I don't know, maybe five, six rows up. Rabbi Feinstein and I are talking. We're laughing. Rabbi Schulweis is all the way at the end of the uh, um, permanent seats turns around, screams at me, don't surrender. <laughs> and we start cracking up. So for me, surrender is, 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 is actually allowing myself to be defeated by a higher truth. And I have to tell you, in all these years, I've always surrendered to Rabbi Schulweis. Because Rabbi Schulweis has always told me a higher truth. His life of both and he gave us the inspiration to really make Beit Shuva Jewish. We tell the story that he told about the Rebbe, who used to see all of the ne'er-do-wells in his town, and his students came to him and said, Rebbe, what could you possibly have to talk about with those people? And the Rebbe said, it's true I haven't done any of these things. But every time I sit in front of them, I see a piece of me except once, and then I knew. Rebbe, Rebbe, what did you know? I knew I was hiding from myself. And everything we do at Beit Shuva is because we learned that we can't hide from ourselves. And that story of, of your husband and your father and your grandfather has stayed with my wife and myself believing in both and, searching for truth, and everybody matters. That's the whole basis of Beit Shuva. So Beit Shuva really exists because of Rabbi Harold Showweis and because of the power of his teachings. And so I do surrender to him. I surrender to his higher truth. And I please, please God, all of us will continue to surrender his higher truth of getting involved, being active, making a difference, and never passing anybody by as if they don't matter. Ron Wolfson is professor of Jewish education at the American Jewish University. Ron Wolfson is the author of uh, many dozens of books, including a book that came out last year called Relational Judaism, which is a, the most important revolution in the way Jewish communities organize synagogues since Rabbi Shulweis's sermon in 1970 on Chavurot. 
Uh, Ron Shulman is my next door neighbor and a very long time member. Wolfson, Shulman. Shulman's a good guy too. But he lives in Baltimore. Wolfson is my next door neighbor and, uh, and a long time member of the congregation, a long time congregant of Rabbi Shulweiss. Thank you. Thank you, sweetie. This microphone is actually better than that. Really? One. Yeah, I don't know why. Okay. We are next door neighbors. <laughs> And I understand Rabbi Farkas is going to be my new next door neighbor. I'm thrilled. Great. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Feinstein. Um, on Friday morning last week, I did a Schulweis. I woke up. I couldn't sleep. It was 3 in the morning. I couldn't sleep. So I went into my study to my computer, and I wrote an appreciation of your wonderful husband, your wonderful father, your wonderful grandfather, and my rabbi. And I sent it to the Jewish Journal at 8 o'clock in the morning on Friday, and they posted it immediately. And some of you saw it and uh, thanked me for it, and I thought tonight, uh, with this great honor Rabbi Feinstein has given me, that I would share it with you. The movie's better. It was the summer of 1974 when I arrived in Los Angeles. A friend of mine told me about a rabbi in the San Fernando Valley who was transforming his synagogue into one of the most dynamic congregations in the city, if not the country. There are a thousand people every Friday night, he said. When a thousand people were showing up for a worship service, then like now, I wanted to know what was happening. Rabbi Harold Schulweis was happening. On that Friday night at Valley Beth Shalom, I witnessed the future of synagogue life in America, shaped by a rabbi who had a clear vision of what a kilak Shah, sacred community, could and should be. The sanctuary was packed to overflowing. The music was sensational. The Kabbalat Shabbat service was shaped by Kavanot, small intentional comments from Rabbi Shoais that framed the meaning of the prayers for all of us. The sermon was spectacular, engaging, relevant, moving. After the service, there was a beautiful Kiddush and Israeli dancing. It was a happening. Like Rabbi Feinstein, the minute I experienced the, the service, I said to my wife Susie, I want this man to be our rabbi. And when I found out about a house for sale on Densmore Avenue, I bought it in five minutes. In fact, Susie was in Palm Springs with our children visiting my parents. I was teaching at the University of Judaism. She didn't even see the place. And I bought it in five minutes because I couldn't imagine a better place to raise our family than four blocks from Valley Beth Shalom. For nearly 40 years, I've been his congregant and his disciple, watching in awe a Jew in the pew as this rabbi's rabbi built one of the most dynamic synagogue communities in the world. A disciple of Mordecai Kaplan, Martin Buber, and Abraham Joshua Heschel, Rabbi Schulweis, combined their teachings with his own deep knowledge of classical Jewish texts and philosophy to inspire and challenge all of us, his beloved flock, of VBS. Next month, I will once again have the privilege of teaching a course on creating sacred communities to a group of aspiring rabbis at the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies at the American Jewish University. I am not now, nor have I ever been, a rabbi. But I've been blessed to observe hundreds of rabbis over these 40 years. And there is no one, no one, like Rabbi Harold M. Schulweis. So here then is my lesson plan for my first class this January, when I will share with my students the top 10 God-given midot, characteristics, attributes, that made Rabbi Schulweis the greatest pulpit rabbi I have ever known. Number one, be an extraordinary teacher, whether in a formal Friday night 
or a holiday sermon, an adult education class, or it has groundbreaking transformation of having a dialogue with his congregation instead of a sermon on Shabbat morning. Rabbi Shoai shared his knowledge in a way that was totally accessible, revelatory, and stimulating. You always walked away from a Shoaisian study session thinking. Number two, be a humorist. You also walked away laughing. Rabbi Shoais punctuated his sermons with funny stories, Yiddish aphorisms, which he always translated for us, and self-deprecating humor. And the stories were always on point. I'll bet you remember one of Rabbi's favorite words was echad, oneness, unity. He began his famous Rosh Hashanah sermon about echad by noting that all Jews basically pray the same way, but they have different dialects. The traditional Jew says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. The atheist Jew says, Shema Yisrael, I deny Eloheinu, I deny Echad. <laughs> and the agnostic Jew, the agnostic Jew, who's not sure whether there is a God, but he has a good neshama, a good soul, he says, Shema Yisrael, I don't know Eloheinu, I don't know Echad. An intellectual giant who could confound his congregants with unpronounceable and obscure words. He never failed to poke fun at himself. He loved ribbing his colleagues. He loved being ribbed himself. Remember those poem spiels? Always with a hearty laugh. One year, Camp Ramah honored Max Vorspan. Alava Shalom. Some of you remember my colleague, Rabbi Max Vorspan. The dinner was right here at VBS next door. And I was tasked with creating a tribute video for Max. Knowing the dinner was at VBS, my shul, I went through the old tapes of a public service television show Max had on Sunday morning at CBS. Do some of you remember? It was called Commitment. And wouldn't you know, for the first broadcast of the year, right before Rosh Hashanah, Max's favorite guest was Rabbi Harold Schulweis. I found three of these episodes. The first was from 1970. Rabbi's first year at VBS, Max introduced him and asked, so Rabbi Shoais, tell us the meaning of the High Holidays. Rabbi Shoais, a young man, said, Rosh Hashanah is the birthday of the world. Yom Kippur is the time for celebration, a time for cheshbon hanefesh, an accounting of the soul. The High Holidays are yamim noraim, the days of awe. And then Max, interviewing Rabbi Shoais, on the same program, on the same set, but in 1976. Rabbi Shoais, Max says, tell us the meaning of the High Holy Days. <laughs> Rabbi Shoais thinks for a minute, and then he says, Rosh Hashanah is the birthday of the world. <laughs> Yom Kippur is the time for Cheshbon HaNefesh, an accounting of the soul. Thy High Holidays are Yamim Noraim, the days of awe. And then the third clip was from 1982. Max asks, Rabbi Shoais, tell us about the meaning of the High Holidays. Rabbi Shoais smiles and says, Rosh Hashanah is the birthday of the world. <laughs> Yom Kippur is the hesh time for Heshbon HaNefesh, an accounting of the soul, and the High Holidays are Yamim Noraim, the days of awe. No one enjoyed this gotcha moment more than Rabbi Shoais. As soon as the video was over, he made a beeline to me at the party, and he said, Ron, that's the funniest thing I've seen in a very long time. <laughs> Thank you. Number three, be a pastor. Rick Warren, the pastor of Saddleback Church, teaches other pastors, say something on Sunday that your people can use on Monday. Rabbi Shulais knew this. He spoke directly to the hearts of his people, often telling true stories he heard from his congregants without attribution, but remember those stories from his study? He talked about the challenges of parenting. Your children are not nachas producing machines. <laughs> the cost of holding a grudge. Forgive each other before asking God for forgiveness. The sometimes suffocating feeling Jewish children have this very week in December. He called it Santa claustrophobia. <laughs> and then he told a wonderful joke about the Jewish guy who needed some extra money. So he took a job as a Santa Claus in the shopping mall. 
A little five-year-old Jewish boy cajoles his parents into letting him sit on Santa's knee. The Jewish Santa says to the little boy, ho, 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 and what do you want for Christmas? And the little Jewish boy says, oh, Santa, I'm not Christmas, I'm Hanukkah. The Santa smiles, pats the child on the head and says, a gesint auf dein Kippele. <laughs> a blessing on your head. The message of our rabbi was, you come to Valley Beth Shalom, your life will be different. It'll be deeper. It'll be more meaningful and more purposeful. Number four, be a social activist. Rabbi, always an eager, didn't we always eagerly anticipate his high holiday sermons? Remember how we all look forward to it? His sermon always ended with a lefichach, a therefore. Therefore, we will create a counseling center at the synagogue with its own separate private entrance so clients won't feel ashamed. Therefore, we will establish Kavurot so no one will ever feel alone. Judaism is a world religion, therefore will not stand idly by while genocide is happening in Africa. Every such sermon ended with an invitation to come to a meeting. Remember that? Come next Tuesday. Come Tuesday night and join me in taking the next steps. Number five, inspire your partners. Rabbi Shulais understood a rabbi alone cannot build a congregation of relationships. So he empowered his board to become para-rabbinics, actually teaching him how to perform the functions of a rabbi, visiting the sick, leading a shiva minyan, counseling bar bat mitzvah families at home visits. He took his leadership on an annual retreat to camp, knowing there's no more effective educational setting than a total immersive experience of Shabbat. I want shutafim, partners, he would say, and hundreds of us responded to his call. Number six, be a davener, a musician. Rabbi Shoais never led a prayer service by calling page numbers. He led by example. Above the choir, above the chazan, you heard his booming baritone davening. He loved to raise his voice in prayer. He wanted his congregation to sing, to clap hands, to dance, to embrace each other as we sang Sholem Aleichem, or Shabbat morning Kiddush. He loved his long-serving cantor, Herschel Fox, encouraging him to engage the community in prayer and Yossi in the Daily Minion. He commissioned the great Ami Aloni to compose original music for the service, melodies that were instantly singable and that raised our spirits. Number seven, be a poet. Read the remarkable poetry of Rabbi Harold Schulweis that graced our worship and your heart will be moved. It's all on the Schulweis Institute website, curated by the wonderful Bert Trigo. Number eight, be a builder. When Heschel Day School, founded by our, my friends, the Liners, moved to Northridge from the campus of Valley Beth Shalom. Rabbi Shoais established his own Jewish day school. When the synagogue grew in numbers, he expanded these facilities. When it's clear he needed additional staff, he invited bright young rabbis to join him, rabbis such as Ed Feinstein, who cherished the opportunity to sit at his feet to learn his Torah, to emulate his rabbinate. Number nine, be a visionary. Rabbi Shoais could see the future, and he knew what he needed to be done, what he needed to do, what we needed to do to create it. He had an idea a minute. He could not sleep at night. He called himself a part-time insomniac. <laughs> Full-time insomniac, Malka says. <laughs> I understand he never slept on Friday night. He was so keyed up from his sermon on Friday night and what he was going to say Shabbat morning. He was restless with a long list of things that had to be done, causes of the merited support, the wrongs that needed righting. He understood the importance of interfaith relations. He championed righteous Gentiles. He welcomed Jews by choice, LGBTQ, the Jews in recovery. He invited bereavement groups to meet every Thursday night in the synagogue. He pushed the conservative movement. I went to rabbinical uh, assembly conventions where the rabbis were sitting on the edge of their seats hanging on every word of this prophetic voice, a voice of conscience, a voice of challenge, a voice steeped in tradition, but unafraid of change. Number 10, be a friend. Rabbi Shoais enjoyed nothing more than walking through his congregation during those Torah processionals, greeting his people and guests. This was no perfunctory task for him. He stopped to shake hands, to hear a comment, to embrace children, 
inevitably as the Torah scrolls were placed in the ark, he was still working the sanctuary. <laughs> at the end of each service, he stood at the door, anchoring a receiving line. So he once again could connect with his congregants and the many visitors who came to see what was happening at VBS. When there was a simcha or a loss, inevitably, there was a personal letter, a phone call, a visit. Rabbi Shua has taught that God resides in the between, in the relationships among human beings shaped to be B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. This he modeled in his relationships with each and every one of us. We learn in Pirkei Avot, Find yourself a rabbi, and you will make a friend. Rabbi Shuais also knew, Make yourself a friend to your people, and they will make you their rabbi. One more thing. I'm going to teach these rabbis from the example of Rabbi Shuais, this extraordinary man. His love his admiration, and his pride for his Malka and their children and grandchildren. It was clear to all of us, every single one of us, that you, the family, were the very foundational grounding for his work. A rabbi is a very public figure. Without the support of family, it's impossible to truly be present to the thousands of people clamoring for your time and your attention. But the twinkle in his eye when he spoke of Malka, the smile on his face when they embraced after a service, or on the dance floor at a simcha, this was a life lesson to be savored and cherished and emulated. There is not one thing that I teach, there is not one thing that I have written that is not influenced by Rabbi Harold M. Scholes. I, like so many others, was blessed for having had the honor of calling him my rabbi. That's the greatest compliment a rabbi can get, my rabbi. You have earned, Rabbi Shoais, what you've always aspired for us, the immortality of influence. Your teachings, your legacy, and your example will always be a blessing to rabbis, teachers, and synagogue leaders for generations to come. May your memory be a blessing.